All right, we, we've got three examples that we pulled, and I, I tried to give some sort of description. Uh, I've taken the city names off uh, for at least one of my examples. I know the city's here, so if you all remember something differently or whatever, you feel free to let me know, but I tried to keep the city names off. Uh, one of them here was Woodland Estates. This was a large, uh, it was a single family residential development. Uh, this one they proposed to redirect runoff. Their site, I'll show you, their site split where it drains two different directions. They wanted to take water that drained one direction and send it another direction. Uh, there was historical flooding involved in a couple of locations and there was not a, uh, there, there was a model available uh, to do this particular one. Uh, the orange yellow looking thing up there that says Woodland Estates, uh, that's actually an entire rectangle. It goes all the way down to uh, the Main Street Road. There's a large kind of orange rectangle. Uh, part of it is underneath the, the pink watershed color there. Uh, that was the property in question. That's what was going to develop. It was 85 acres. Uh, the orange part of it drained over to the, uh, the southeast corner of the property and there was historical flooding along this side, along that subdivision, and the property owners did not want this development to occur. Uh, there was also, uh, down more towards just the southern edge, the call it the southwestern edge, where it says design point A. That was a culvert that goes under Main Street. And then there's a short little tributary that goes down through subbasin B there, and it goes to design point B, that little green dot towards the bottom, and that's 10 Mile Creek. Uh, for those of you all not familiar with Ten Mile Creek, it goes through DeSoto, Duncanville, Cedar Hill, Lancaster, Dallas. It's a fairly good-sized watershed, uh, and there, there was a model available for Ten Mile Creek watershed. So this is one of those examples to where you didn't have to do hydrology for all of Ten Mile Creek. That would have been higher than that $10,000 cap I showed you earlier if you had to develop hydrology for that. Um, but in this case, you know, and I'll even show you how easy it was here in a minute, but in this case, you just basically took the hydrograph out of that one and stuck it into the, your model. Um, the developer of this, uh, so when you look at this, the uh, purple area up here, that's a 150 acre watershed, where you can see it includes part of the site, and the developer was proposing to change that purple watershed, and they wanted to include the, the orange yellow because of the property issues, uh, the flooding issues off to the, off to the right of the screen there. So they wanted to, to change that. The city said, well, you got to do a downstream assessment anyway. Include that redirect of flow in your downstream assessment and let's, let's, let's see where the chips fall. Let's, let's see the data and let's talk about it. Um, I pretty much covered that, but basically the reason the developer wanted to do that was he's trying to get away from the, the property owners who opposed this project. So he wanted to redirect the water, fix their problem, and, and be a good neighbor. Uh, in order to build this model, you, we did two basin model. So you did uh, um, two basins on the upstream side, subbasin A, subbasin B, and then you t we took out of that 10 mile creek model, took the, basically just the hydrograph out of the, the Army Corps of Engineers model for 10 mile creek, and you just basically took the hydrograph at that point and then had that as your design point B. So you had design point A, which was Main Street, that they were sending more water to that, to that little tributary to the culvert under Main Street, and then you had design point B, which was the confluence with Ten Mile Creek. Uh, the red doesn't show up real well up there, but the very top is design point A, and at the very bottom is design point B, and they're in red. The rest of the numbers are in black. Uh, there's six columns up there. There's the pre-development drainage area, the 100-year pre-development peak discharge, the post-developed drainage area, the post-development peak discharge, and then the last two columns over here are the comparison between existing and proposed. So at the top, you can see they're proposing out of their 85-acre site, they're proposing to send 43 acres, you know, right around half of it, in a different direction. So at design point A at Main Street and for that tributary, uh, they're sending an additional 43 acres there, and they're sending an additional 312 CFS. So, and that's a combination of they sent more area that direction, but they also developed their site, changed the from existing to proposed conditions. Then down at the very bottom, you can see that, again, there's still roughly 43 acres extra they sent to 10 Mile Creek, but they've only increased 10 Mile Creek flow by 39 CFS, roughly, 38.9. And 10 Mile Creek at this point had, I don't remember the exact number, but somewhere between 10 and 20,000 CFS. So from a city's perspective, when you're talking about 10 Mile Creek, 
you're not too worried about that. And that, that, that's a, just a good example there of timing if you look at this. If you look at design point A and you see that they've impacted it by over 300 CFS, they've, they have more than 50% doubled the flow on that tributary, yet it only had an effect of 38, 39 CFS. That to me means that the timing when you develop that property, you add the impervious area, you got it to 10 Mile Creek quicker, you mitigated 280 or whatever, whatever, however the math works out there, you mitigated 280 of it by not doing detention, by getting it to 10 Mile Creek quicker. But in this particular case, you, you couldn't ignore the fact of, well, that's, that's great on 10 Mile Creek, and the city was even remotely open to the idea that we're not too worried about what you're doing to 10 Mile Creek. There, there's already problems on 10 Mile Creek, flooding problems, but we're not too worried because we're actually kind of worried that if you do a detention pond and detain it, you may actually make it a lot worse on 10 Mile Creek. That was one thought the city had. So there's like, we're not too worried about 10 Mile Creek. So the first one was, do we require on-site detention? That's a possibility because you've got to do something about this culvert under Main Street that you're doubling the flow. It used to be 300 and 82 CFS and you're sending 695 CFS there, an increase of 312 CFS. We've got to do something about that culvert that you're impacting, plus that whole tributary, you know, across that private property. We got to do something about that. Maybe there's some city developer joint project or something there, or maybe we're going to require on-site detention. And they were in the middle of all those discussions when everything, the market collapsed and this development never happened. But this was a situation to where it makes you think, you know, we got a lot more data and it's just making me scratch my head more. You know, it's, it's the, the answer's not clear. The, there's more data out here, but uh, the next step would have been, all right, if you're gonna do a pond, now model your pond and tell us what you're doing to 10 Mile Creek. You know, if you're increasing it by 1,000 CFS or, you know, we're gonna have a problem there too. And that's, that's where this was heading before the economy crashed. Any questions about this one? Joe? Did you have to do an assessment of the other watershed that was affected by the reduction of the area? Uh, did not. They did not uh, require that to be. Uh, what were you thinking there? Uh, well, it pressed at the very bottom on junction point, I'm sorry, on design point B. Uh, maybe some of the offset of the drainage, uh, of, of the total uh, flow rate on 10 Mile Creek could have been abated by fact that the 300 CFS that was going to that other watershed was now coming to this one, whereas it may have had a longer water course and then the, <coughs> the next downstream point on Ten Mile Creek would have shown the reflection of the reduction at that point. It could have been where the... It's not a bad thought. That's possible. Uh, yeah. No, and just to repeat the question for the camera, Joe was mentioning that if you had looked where did this water go? And if it had a longer course to 10 Mile Creek and you, you study a little bit farther, maybe the effects even play out even more um, farther downstream you go, which it certainly is possible. Yes, sir. Did your tables, uh, <coughs> your proposed ultimate, did that include the detention that they're uh, required? No. This was so without words, detention. They didn't want the 39, they didn't want the 300 increase at Maine, so they say, we're going to do detention anyway. Well, there was two options. These were the two options that were, see it says determine solution, and there was two things on the table that were being actively talked about before the economy crashed. Uh, the first one was, we've got to do something. We can't have you causing an increase on private property by double, you know, by 300 CFS, and we're already, you know, Main Street's going to overtop. We can't have you do that. Uh, do we do some improvements together? Maybe city developer improvements? Uh, that, that was one thing that was being discussed. Uh, the other thing that was being discussed was maybe the city didn't want to be part of that and you just do on-site detention. But at the same time, it never got modeled. Everything stopped before they actually modeled putting a pond in. And uh, you know, you could design a pond to get rid of the 300 and something CFS. I guarantee you this is gonna go up. But the question we is how much? How much it, it, we didn't get to that point. So I hope it comes back. I'd like to see how this story ends. Uh, this one, a lot, lot smaller project. Uh, this was a city that had, well, actually, this city's here too. So if you remember something different, you let me know. Um, th this city had adopted ice swim. They required downstream assessments. Uh, this was years ago when uh, natural gas drilling was going crazy and pad sites were going everywhere. Uh, and there was no model available on this one. So 
This is uh, the West Fork of the Trinity River, and I believe you're behind levees up here, and there's an old cutoff oxbow back behind the levee, and then you've got a little tributary that drains down to that old cutoff oxbow. Uh, the little yellow rectangle up there is a proposed pad site for uh, natural gas drilling. It was 2.1 acres. Um, there was not a model available for this watershed. Obviously, there was one available for the West Fork of the Trinity River, but we didn't have to go that far. Uh, when you delineated this watershed that the pad site dumped into at the Oxbow before it got to the Trinity River, that was 545 acres. So you can see we're well over 10% at that point, we're, or under. Uh, we're, we should, theoretically, we should only have to go to about 21 acres, and we're going to 545 acres just by discharging off our site. Uh, went through the process of changing curve numbers and time of concentrations. So curve numbers switched from a 69 up to an 85. Uh, so you can tell it wasn't you know, all concrete, there was some gravel and things like that, but 69 to 85, time of concentrations changed pretty substantially. And this is one thing that Ben mentioned, but I wanna point out real clear. And it goes back towards, can you model a small watershed with HMS or not? It's not, the idea here is you're doing this just for the downstream assessment and it's apples to apples. You're gonna run a model one way under existing conditions, and then you're gonna change it and model it proposed and run that again and compare the results. So if your curve numbers aren't exact, it's not the end of the world. The more important thing here is the time of concentration. Did you get the watershed time of concentration right? How everything is gonna combine? It's not necessarily that you're gonna use these peak discharges, and as long as you're apples to apples between your model, it's really the comparison that you care about. So we changed the parameters. Um, Yes, that is correct. And we split it into two pieces because it drained two different ways into the oxbow. Um, and basically, take into account, even though the curve numbers changed pretty substantially, you saw it from 69 to 85, time of concentration changed very substantially from you know, five to one. Uh, it dropped at one CFS when you combined it with the oxbow. Again, just the timing of the hydrographs and how they combine together uh, counteracted the change in time of concentration and the uh, curve number impacts. Any questions on this one? You had to develop a uh, model then for the 545 acres. Did, yes. So this one would probably have been more towards the higher end uh, of that estimate of the fee. I th I'm thinking this one was in the $7,000 range we spent on this. Yes, Jeff? And this is a note of caution. Curve number is always based on soil types. So if your soil type is not changing, you have to be careful that curve number is not the thing you change. You change the impervious cover, and not the unless well in this case. Well, we're using an average curve number. You, you've uh, got a you've got a different type of soil, a, a pad site, which is actually in you know, flex space for some sort of uh, crushed gravel. Sure. So, so be careful that depending on the methodology that your city uses, that you're you may not want their cur the curve number to actually change. You may want to change the impervious cover. Yeah, that's a good point. There's two ways of doing it. If that wasn't clear, there's you can either do it to where you're changing curve numbers, or you're leaving curve numbers alone and you're changing them. So this is the way to curve number approach here. Yeah, yeah. yeah, this is the way to curve number approach. All right. So the third example here is mixed use development. Uh, City is here on this one as well. Uh, two discharge locations, no hydrology model was available, uh, but we were under contract to do hydrology for this watershed by that same city. And it just so happened that we also had a private development uh, that needed a downstream assessment. This one, this graphic is not the best, but at the top you can see the cyan line between the green dots one and two. Everybody can kind of see that? <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Uh, over at, on the left-hand side of the screen, that's tributary G1. On the left-hand side of the screen, it flows from left to right all the way across the stream. This stream G1 in the location of this aerial photograph is somewhere around 800 acres, so 780 acres. Uh, the site in question is this purple red area right right in here that was the site in question that was going to develop into a mixed use it split it drained into two directions part of the site drained to the east where it went to a roadway and if i remember right we we're also under contract to design that roadway and to design the storm drain system for fully developed conditions 
and over on the left side of the site, it all drained over there to, to dot one, basically. It dumped into you know, the tributary G1 over on the northwest corner. The rest of it drained to the northeast corner. And it went, would go into the storm drain system down the roadway and then dump into the tributary G1 close to point two. Everybody follow that? All right, so from this standpoint, the site, again, was split into two different basins since it drained two different directions. Uh, curve numbers, again, this is weighted curve numbers, uh, went from 87 to 90 and 84 to 89. So this is one where clearly it's very clay soil. It's, you know, not much different than concrete uh, in that situation. Time of concentration changed a lot. You know, it went from 28 minutes and 35 minutes to 14 and to 10. So time of concentration changed considerably with the development of it. Uh, and, and then at each of those points, point one, it decreased by 49 CFS without detention. So that site developed as mixed use without detention, decreases it by 49 CFS, and the other one by 48 CFS. Now the key here is on point two. Point one wasn't a problem because this site discharged directly into a culvert that went into the tributary. But on point two, it was essential that there was a storm drain system that could handle fully developed flow down the roadway to get the water into the creek at point two. So that was a key part of this. Any questions on that one? All right, uh, let me re-ask the question. Uh, I asked at the beginning, uh, do you all think that our current detention policies, our Q equals CIA, uh, us just looking at the property line and thinking we're going to put in detention just to keep it to peak flow. Have I changed anybody's mind? Does anybody think that's too simple, that maybe it doesn't work quite the way we think? I changed one mind, two minds. Joe, you weren't here, so I didn't change your mind. I'm sure you already knew that. So I changed a few minds today. But the, to me, this is a called a paradigm shift, change in methodology, philosophy. But it is something where we have tried so hard to simplify this and make it so easy for everybody. And let's just look at the property lines. Let's build a pond. Let's not, uh, let's not change the peak flow. That if It's more complicated than that. Nature is more complicated. When it rains and what runs off and how everything combines, you really do have to look downstream at the zone of influence. That's what we've got. Any, any questions?